you take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Colossians, chapter 2, tonight, Colossians, chapter 2. And we are going to begin in verse 10, which is the verse that we ended with last time. And we're only going to go through verse 14. Uh, by rights, we really should go through the end of the chapter, or at least down through verse 16. But uh, I know what's going to happen if we do that. It will just take too long. So we're going to break it into two. Really what we're going to look at tonight is our complete salvation. And next time, uh, really from verse uh, 15 on, uh, we're going to look at the results of that complete salvation and what that practically means to you and to me. But tonight we're going to look at Colossians 2, verse 10 through verse number 14. If you'd find your place there, we'll begin in verse number 10. Paul says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, Lord, these are somewhat difficult verses to understand, uh, but very meaningful when we do understand them. And Lord, we do ask you tonight for help. We realize that for those of us who are saved, the Holy Spirit is resident inside of us. The same Holy Spirit who penned these words, holy men of God, speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so, Lord, we have the author who lives inside of us. Would you help us and illumine us and help us to interpret these verses correctly that we might understand what you meant by it when you wrote it down so that we would know how these truths apply to us. And, Lord, that we might marvel at so great salvation that you have provided for us. May we be joyful and restful and peaceful and confident in our salvation. And, Lord, may we express that joy to others and want to share what we have with those around us. And so, Lord, would you help us tonight? Be with those who are here. Be with those who could not be here. Maybe those who are working and so on tonight. And uh, I pray that you would preserve and protect and help them too. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last time we saw, and the last sermon was chapter 2, verse 1, down to verse number 10. And we saw in those verses Paul's involvement in the great conflict over false teachings that the church at Colossae was facing. If you look at verse 1, he says, For I would that you know uh, that you knew what great conflict I have for you. And we talked about um, that when there's falsehood, there is conflict. And really, there ought to be conflict. Because if you're standing for the truth, then there will be conflict with falsehood. It's always the case, no matter what area of life. So when we saw in verse 1, then, he was interested in the conflict. Uh, he was involved in it, um, rightfully so. Verse 2, he said that he prayed for them and their conflict, because really, we need God's help when we face spiritual conflict because our, our warfare is not carnal, it's spiritual, and so we need prayer. And verse 4, we see that he warned them in the conflict, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. He's warning against these false teachers, the Gnostics, the Judaizers, people who were perverting the message of God and distorting the gospel and making it into something that God did not intend, and they were really uh, changing the message of the gospel and that, of course, is very, very serious with God because it is through the gospel that people get saved. And then from verse 6, uh, he instructed them uh, in the conflict. What should they do and how should they live? Well, uh, they receive Christ by faith and he wants them to walk by faith. And we saw that in verse 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Kind of like what Pastor, our brother uh, Flanders was talking about, um, how that we come to Christ empty-handed and we have to trust him completely to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves in order to save us we need someone outside of ourselves to save us and that's what we got on salvation and he says as you receive christ jesus the lord so walk ye in him so the continuation of the christian life is very simple it's just like how you got saved the walks you know we're saved by faith the just shall live by faith and so we come to god every day and say lord i can't do this 
Um, I'm, I'm weak in myself. I need you to do that, which I cannot do for myself. I need someone outside of me to help me to live the Christian life and to do what is right and to be, live a life pleasing to you. And uh, Lord, that I would understand the falsehoods and understand where people are enticing me with enticing words and trying to get me away from the truth of the gospel. And so he gave them not only warning, but instructions. Now, there's two great conflicts in the New Testament that we see, and it really surrounds Jesus. Uh, he is the focal point of the, the enemy's darts, and he wants, to cons- he wants us to doubt or he wants us to change what the Bible has to say about who Jesus is and what Jesus did. That's the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus. And in the person and work of Jesus, that's the name of Jesus. When the Bible speaks about the name of Jesus, it's speaking about him and who he is and what he accomplished. And of course, if somebody comes along and says, well, Jesus is not really God, then they're attacking his person. Uh, If they say he's not really man, uh, that all material things are are evil and Jesus could not possibly be um, a true man. Uh, He is both God and man. And so, Uh, People attack the person of Christ, then the work of Christ. Well, and this is really the uh, question that Paul is answering here in these verses. It's an important question. And the question is this, is my salvation complete in Christ? The salvation that we have, is is it complete in Christ? If you have Jesus, is really that all that you need? Or do I need to add anything to it? Um, Do I need to do something to that my work comes alongside the work of Christ in some fashion, or am I completely complete in him without any input from myself as far as my righteousness or my efforts or my deserving anything from God? Very, very important question. And this is where the Judaizers and other false teachers were going wrong, and it's still going wrong. People are still getting it wrong today, big time. This is really the religion of man. Uh, the religion, religion of man is that they send that Jesus is not. You, yes, you can believe on Jesus. very important to believe on Jesus, but you also need other things. Now, I want you to keep your place there in Colossians and go back to Acts 15. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And that's true of falsehood concerning the gospel. The same problems we face today, they face back then, which is kind of good because it means that it was written about back then. And so we can go and look at what the Bible has to say about it in order to defend the true gospel in our day today. And so in Acts chapter 15, there was a problem. There were false teachers, and they were coming to Paul and the Christians of that day, really the the Gentiles, uh, these men were coming from Jerusalem, saying that they had, uh, in fact, if you look over at verse 24, it says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us, that is from the church of Jerusalem, have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we give no such commandment. So these guys were coming out of Jerusalem, from the church of Jerusalem, go to these, these Gentile churches and says, Well, now what Paul taught you about Jesus is correct, and you need to believe on Jesus, but you must also be circumcised. You must also come under the covenants of Abraham, which means circumcision, and under the covenants with Moses, which means keeping the law. And so you have to do those things too. And Paul was saying, now wait a second, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that salvation is not of the shadows and the things of the past, the circumcision and keeping the law of Moses. So anyway, they're going to have this big conference about him, the Jerusalem conference in Acts 15. So look at verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Okay, so now if that was true, every one of us would have to be circumcised, at least the men in here would have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, there's the conflict Wherever, wherever there's falsehood, there should be conflict. And here's, here's this uh, disputation, this disagreement. This, uh, uh, it was really a holy row was going on here. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. So these people were coming, they suppose, with authority from Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas says, well, let's go to Jerusalem. Let's talk to James. Let's talk to uh, Peter. Let's talk to the apostles in Jerusalem. Verse 3, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. Paul was, he was so excited about the Gentiles being saved without being circumcised, without keeping the law of Moses. 
There was a change in their life. They had a testimony. He's telling the churches in Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. They were so happy. Verse 4, And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. In other words, they were not false teachers. Paul and Barnabas were not considered outsiders. They were welcomed into the church and of the apostles, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed. These are supposed to be Christians now. They're Pharisees, but they're believing Pharisees, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's referring to Acts chapter uh, uh, 10 and 11, where Cornelius, the first Gentile, a Roman centurion, heard the gospel in his house, and his whole household heard it from Peter. Before Peter got finished his message, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit indwelled those. Obviously, they believed, they spoke with tongues to evidence that the Holy Spirit was there, and then evidence that they were saved, and those people were saved without being circumcised, and those people were saved without any sort of adherence to the law of Moses. Now, this, So Peter's going to use that as an illustration to back up what Paul is saying. And he says... Um, in verse 8, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So how is God going to help Peter to understand that these Gentiles are saved in that meeting? How do you know somebody's saved? You know, the only way we know somebody's saved today is if someone will say, I got saved. Did you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Did you put your confidence in him and his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins? And they said, yes, that's what I did. And then we say, well, well, you're saved because that's, that's, that, that's the gospel. Like, can someone say that and not mean it and not really be saved? Yeah. So how, how is God going to convince Peter that these people were really, really saved? Well, the Bible says that all of them began to speak with other languages. Now, we did a study on that. It's not heavenly gibberish. It's other languages that they didn't know when they were speaking the wonderful works of God. And uh, maybe they were speaking in Hebrew or something that Peter and the other men who were with Peter would have understood. But they knew that those men didn't know. In other words, they, this was a sign from God that the Holy Spirit had come into them. And the Holy Spirit only comes into people who are saved. So God was putting a stamp of approval on Cornelius and his house and that they heard the gospel and believed and God had saved them. That's what he's saying here. God gave them a witness, verse 8. He bore them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, but between the Jew and the Gentile, purifying their hearts by faith. The word purify means to be cleansed, means to be saved. Peter now says to these men, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? In other words, the law of Moses is a heavy thing, and we weren't able to keep it. Verse 11, but we believe that through the grace that is undeserved favor, uh, things that God will do for us rather than us doing for God, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as, the, as they. Hey, Peter says, listen, let me tell you something. They don't need to get saved like us. We get, we get saved like them. They listen, There's nothing in their, in their record that is deserving of salvation, but you know what Peter says? We're in the same boat. We are saved by grace just like the Gentiles are saved by grace. And so the point here is that we are not saved by faith in Christ plus circumcision. We are not saved by grace in, uh, through Christ plus keeping the law. That's what he said in verse 24, that you must be circumcised and keep the law. To whom we give no such commandment. In fact, when they had finished the council, they wrote a letter to all the Gentile churches and says, listen, uh, the circumcision is not needed. Keeping the law is not a requirement for righteousness by grace through faith. And so God was making a point using Cornelius as an example that believers don't have to be circumcised. Aren't you glad about that? Now here's a question, because that's not nearly a, a question for us today. There's really no church in McMinnville that says, now wait a minute, you can believe upon Jesus, but you've got to be circumcised. I don't know of any. But I do know a whole lot of churches that say, well, you can believe on Jesus, but you've got to be baptized. You must be baptized. It's absolutely essential. Your salvation is determined by your, your baptism. 
Let me ask you something from what you know about Acts chapter 10. When Peter was preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on those believers. When they were believing what Peter was saying, they, they spoke with tongues as evidence and to help the, Peter to know that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And these men got saved right in the middle of the message. Then Peter says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Question, was Cornelius saved before he got baptized? It's as, clo- it's as clear as, the no- as my big nose on my face. It's absolutely ironclad true, the Cornelius. God gave him the witness before he got baptized. Baptism is not the gospel. Paul said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, lest the cross of Christ. Um, now, here's the thing. We are saved by believing the gospel. And Paul says that baptism is not part of the gospel. Therefore, baptism is not part of salvation. Is it an important step of obedience for the believer? It absolutely is. You will see this in just a moment. But what we're, at, what we're answering the question here is, is my salvation complete in Christ? If I have Christ, is that all that I need? Or do I have to be circumcised? Do I have to be baptized? Do I have to join the church? Do I have to do this, that, and the other thing? Because where does the list end? And really, how do you know if you fulfill that list? Therefore, how can you have confidence? How could you have assurance that you have done everything? And the fact of the matter is, if there's a list, you can never be sure. But what the Bible says is, if you have Christ, you have everything you need. You're complete in him. And you have a complete salvation in him. And because of that, it's ironclad. You have him. You have salvation. Therefore, you have assurance. You can have confidence. And because you have assurance and confidence, you can be joyful about it. You can be happy and glad because I know for sure. Without any doubt that heaven's my home and that I indeed am wised and I am saved in, uh, through the blood of Christ. So is Jesus' death on the cross and my dependence upon that death enough for salvation? And Paul is emphatically saying absolutely yes. The Bible is saying yes. God is saying yes. And we say yes. So in verse number 10, as we go back to Colossians, in verse number 10, He says, ye are complete in him. Now, those two words, in him, are very important. Because Ephesians chapter 2 says, before we got saved, we weren't in him. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you're not in Christ. But if you've believed upon him and you're saved, then the Bible says, the moment you did that, that God took you and he identified you in Jesus Christ. He actually baptized you. He immersed you in Jesus. Now, we'll get to this in just a moment. The word baptizo is actually a transliteration of the Greek word. Baptism is baptizo in the Greek. And they didn't translate it. They transliterated it. They just used the Greek word. It's kind of like hallelujah. Um, it's not translated. Halle. Halle means praise. Yah is Jehovah. Hallelujah means praise be to Jehovah. Praise the Lord. That's what hallelujah means. But it's not translated in your Bible. It's just transliterated. It's a Hebrew word, which means praise the Lord. And so baptizo or baptism simply means to immerse. The word is used. If somebody's dying a garment, they take the garment and they plunge it underneath the liquid with the dye in it, water with dye in it, uh, in order to dye that garment. And so it means to immerse. Uh, sometimes it means to immerse in water. That's what this is. It's an immersion tank. But the problem for us is, as Baptists and other people who, who understand water baptism, every time we see the word baptized, we're always thinking it means water. But Jesus said to the apostles, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I shall be baptized with? And he was speaking about being submerged in suffering. In grief, overcome, overwhelmed with the pain of rejection and the suffering of the cross. The Bible tells us that we can be immersed into Jesus Christ. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But the Bible explains that we are complete in Christ and his salvation. Okay, so let's look at these verses. The first thing we're going to look at in verse number 11 is that we are dead with Christ. And what we're going to see here is that we're dead with Christ, we're buried with Christ, And that we have already been raised with Christ. And we are alive with Christ. And we've been forgiven by Christ. So in verse number 11, he says, in whom? Do you see in verse uh, verse 10, you're complete in him. 
Uh, you're saved in him. You have everything you need in him. You have heaven in him. It's all in him. When you get saved, you're immersed, you're identified into Jesus Christ. You're placed in him. Your position in the sight of God is that you are not by yourself. You're not out there estranged from the commonwealth of Israel and cut off from the promises of God. No, you are in Christ. And in Christ, all the blessings of God are yours because you're in Christ. We are accepted in the blood. You're acceptable to God because you're in Christ. If you're outside of Christ, you're not accepted. And so he begins verse 11 by saying, in whom? That is in Jesus. In him also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, what does that mean? It means that when we were placed in Christ, uh, something happened that we didn't feel that we didn't see. Now, in verse 13, he says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Question, was he speaking to Jews here? If he says they were uncircumcised in the flesh, were they Jew or Gentile? Well, the Jews are circumcised, so the Gentiles are uncircumcised. He's talking to Gentiles. He's speaking to people who had nothing to do with Moses and nothing to do with Abraham and were not circumcised. They were uncircumcised Gentiles. That's who he's speaking to. And yet in verse number 11, he tells them something. He says, because they are in Christ, in whom also ye are. Ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now, normal circumcision obviously is made with hands. Here's a circumcision that is made without hands. So in other words, this is something not physical, not outward, but it is something inward and it is something spiritual. It's not physical circumcision which could be seen. It is inward circumcision, that which is not seen. Okay. So he's telling us about something that we can't see, we can't understand, except he reveals it to us. And what he's saying, this is when you get saved, when you're placed in Christ, here's some of the things that God did with you. And basically what he's saying here is that you are circumcised. Okay. In the, in the inward man. Now, what does it mean? Now, I don't want to get into the details of physical circumcision. I think most of you are adults and would understand what that is. But if you notice in verse 11, he said, The circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Normal circumcision is the getting rid of part of your body. Cut off the flesh. And what he's saying here in this circumcision made without hands, in, in the, in, because of the death of Christ and our identification and our immersion with Christ, and because we are in Christ, in, the, in our position with God, that we have literally put off the body of flesh. In other words, not part of our body is put off, but our whole body is put off by the circumcision of Christ. And I know that's a difficult concept that kind of get you get your head around but here's what he's basically saying because you're in christ you're dead it's not just part of you day it's not just part of your body that was put off all of your body was put off who has delivered us from this body of death christ has delivered us and in their position with god in god's mind you are already dead when jesus died you were in him when he died you died you say, how do you, where do you get that? Look at Colossians 3 and verse 3, just across the page there. He says, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and gone. He says, you are dead. Look at chapter 2, verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ. Notice now, we're dead with Christ. Um, we are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. So what he's basically saying here in verse number 11 is that we are circumcised not just part of us are circumcised, but in the mind, and the position of God, that which is done without hands, he has um, put off our body that we have. And by the way, the, the body without the spirit is dead, okay? Um, and so this life, this body of flesh, our life before we came to the cross, in our position with, with God in Christ is that we are dead to that life that that's past and we are dead to those things. Now, he goes on with this thought in verse number 12. <clears throat> he says, now what would happen after you die? What's the next thing, next thing that happens at your funeral, right? Well, they put you in the ground. They bury you. 
Now, of course, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And this is what we're reflecting here. In verse 12, he says, buried with him. So we are circumcised, or we're dead with Christ. Um, and now we are buried with Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, what exactly is he saying here? Well, let me think about this. If my death, if he's talking about circumcision as far as putting off the flesh or putting off the body as a symbol of death in Christ, when Jesus died, we died, um, and that's unseen. I didn't feel it. I didn't see it. Then the next step, which is burial, would also be unseen. And what he's basically saying to us is that, and, and by the way, this is going somewhere, so you may not understand it yet, but hang in there because this is the answer to all, to all of our problems. Okay, and we have preached this over and over again. When we did the message on the ark, we, 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 we were heavy on this subject. But he's going to explain to us that we have been identified with Jesus Christ. We have been immersed into Jesus. And God the Father has identified us with Christ. When Jesus died, you died. See, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me, and the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So there was almost like, because of Jesus, when we met Jesus, and God associated us with Jesus, he takes us back 2,000 years, and when Jesus died, we died with him. When Jesus was buried, we were buried with him. Now, again, in verse 12, buried with him in baptism. Now, when you were baptized in water, was Jesus with you? No. See, again, when we see the word baptism, it's the Greek word baptizo, which means immersion. We always think of water. That's, now, here's the thing. This is the shadow. This is uh, the illustration. This is the object lesson. This is not the real deal. Just as when we observe the Lord's table and the bread is the shadow. Uh, this too in remembrance of me. This, is my, this bread represents the flesh of Christ. Is it the flesh of Christ? No. The grape juice, the red grape juice, symbolizes the blood of Christ. Is it the blood of Christ? No, it represents it. It's a shadow of the real substance that happened 2,000 years ago. And this is a shadow of what happened in your life and in your heart the moment that you believed upon Christ. Because what happened when you got saved is that you were buried with him. In baptism, in the sense that uh, you were baptized in the Christ, if you look at the word baptism and, and really think about it in this terms, that baptism is identification. Uh, look, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. This is a very, very important passage. And in verse number 13, we're a Baptist church. We baptize people in water all the time. Well, maybe <laughs> all the time. We wish it was all the time. But often we do that. And who's the one that baptizes them? It's me. The pastor of the church or somebody assigned by the church puts that person under the water. And I like the, I don't like baptisms where the hands sticking up or the legs sticking up. I want them all underneath. You know, you never go by the graveyard and you see a hand sticking out of the grave, right? Because it's a symbol of, of death and burial. And it's I, we're identifying ourselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it's, all, it's almost like an initiation. Do you remember, and we say this all the time, but do you remember when Jesus came to John the Baptist? Why did Jesus get baptized? To identify himself. With who? With John. He, came, he comes to John. He says, I want you to baptize me, John. And John says, wait a second. He says, Lord, I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me. What was John saying? Lord, you don't need to identify yourself with me. I'm not worthy to unlace your, your sandals. You don't need to identify yourself with me. I need to identify myself with you. Baptism is identification. By the way, the baptism of John was the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That was the message of the baptism. That was the identification of the baptism. The identification of Christian baptism is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's a different message altogether. That's why the disciples in Acts 19 were rebaptized by Paul. Were they saved? I believe they were. In fact, I think they were Old Testament believers who became New Testament believers in that transition. But that's another story. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Here's what the Bible says about your immersion in the Christ and your identification with Christ. Now, this happens on scene. 
just like the circumcision happens unseen. This identification with Christ and his burial, his death and burial, is something unseen. In verse 13, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. So who's the one doing the baptizing? It is the Holy Spirit. That's something that is not seen. For by one Spirit are we all baptized. In, and, he, and it's not just some people. It's every Christian. For by one spirit are we all baptized in the one body. Whose body? The body of Christ. Whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink in the one spirit. For the body is not one member but many. And so he talks about the body of Christ, the foot and the hand and the eye and the ear, and how we're, um, when you get saved, immediately the Holy Spirit comes into you. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And when he comes into you, He gives you a spiritual gift, a spiritual ability. You're a hand or a foot or an eye or an ear. And so you're placed into the body of Christ with those abilities the moment you get saved by the person of the Holy Spirit. And you are part of the body of Christ. You're immersed into Christ. In the mind of God, you're identified with the Lord Jesus. He is the head and we are his body. Look over Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 27. Galatians 3. Verse 27, now again, we've been conditioned to think whenever we see the word baptized, it's always got to do with water. Not so. There are places in the Bible where it talks about being baptized in suffering and so on. And so, baptized in the Christ. And here's the same thing. Look at verse 26. He says, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, period. You know what? That's a true statement right there. When you believe upon Christ, it doesn't matter about circumcision or baptism or church membership or good, good works or anything else. When you believe upon Christ, you're a child of God. You're born again by the Spirit of God when you believe upon him. Now, he goes on to explain, verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into water. Is that what it says? And the word baptized means immersed. Immersed into water. Is that what it says? That have been on Christ. Now, the Church of Christ is going to take that, that verse and beat me to death with it. But he's misunderstanding it. Because the Bible says here, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. It's the same thing that he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When you are saved, God associates and identifies you in Jesus Christ. He immerses you into Jesus Christ. Well, what is this? That's an illustration of what has already happened. That you're identified with Christ in his death, and his burial, and his resurrection. And you're saying to the world, this has already happened. And in the mind of God, you have died with Christ, and you have been buried with Christ. And here's the thing, you are risen with Christ. And so, this identification, this in the mind of God, this unseen thing, just like the circumcision, God places us in Christ, And therefore, we are present in Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the substance in the mind of God, and that's the shadow that illustrates it. Don't mix up the two. You see, the Roman Catholics say uh, the bread is really the body of Christ. The, The grape juice is really the blood of Christ. And they're taking the shadow and making it the substance, and you go wrong when you do that. And anybody that says, when you touch the water, you're touching the blood of Christ. When you're touching the water, that's when you get saved. It's the shadow. And here's the danger. The danger is that people put their trust in the shadow. The danger is people put their trust in the shadow. And not the reality. And the reality is the person and work of Jesus Christ. And when you believe and put your confidence and trust in him, you are complete in him. And so we are dead with Christ. And we are buried with Christ. Now if we go back to Colossians. And notice some of the detail here. In verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him. And notice it goes on to say, through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. When you were put in this water, did God raise you out of that water? The preacher raised you out of the water. God didn't do it. But when you were associated with Jesus Christ, it is the operation of God who both raised him and you. In his heart and in his mind. In the identification. In other words, your classification with God is you're in Christ. And when Christ died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. When he was raised, you were raised. Now that's important. Because in verse 12 again, he says, And ye are risen with him. Through the faith of the operation of God, he hath raised him from the dead. In the mind of God, when Jesus rose, you rose. Now this is really important. 
And I want you to to, to, to underline the word are there. Ye are risen with him. Now, this is our position. Look at Colossians 3 verse 1. He says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. And so that's our position with Christ. Now, here's the thing. Um, in a practical way, we haven't been raised yet. Right? If you, I mean, you read 1 Corinthians 15, um, you know, Christ is the first fruits, then they that are Christ that is coming, speaking about the resurrection. Have you, have you physically been resurrected yet? No, you haven't died yet either. So this has got to do with something unseen, our position, our identification in the mind of God. Because he says both things here. Look down at verse 3 again. He says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. As far as practical reality and practical truth is concerned, you have not been raised yet. But positionally, you have been raised in verse 1, if ye then be risen. Verse 12, ye are risen with him. Now, what in the world is this all about? And what, 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 what does it mean? And why is it important? Go back, please, to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Is everybody warm in here? <laughs> I think I got myself in trouble this morning. Because <laughs> I turned the heat down, or I turned the cool on. And I think some of the ladies were a little cool. And I do apologize for that, but it does get warm up here. I want you to be comfortable. I'll, I'll, you know, I can take my coat off if I need to. Romans chapter 7 helps us to understand why it's so important that you're dead. Because the law, and this is where he's going to go with this, so hang in here. okay? The law demands something for you. What does the Bible say? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. What is sin? Sin is the breaking of the law. The wages of sin is death. Okay, so is there anybody, just to, so we can rule you out, is there anybody in here that hasn't sinned? Because if you haven't sinned, this won't apply to you and you can just go on home tonight. Anybody here not sinned? Okay, so we kind of safely assume that everybody has sinned in here. And that's what the Bible says, all of sin comes out of the glory. Okay, so we're all in the same boat. And it doesn't matter if you're a big sinner or a little sinner, a uh, bad sinner, not so bad sinner, we've all sinned. And so the Bible says to offend the law in one point, we we're guilty of all of the law. And what is the penalty for breaking the law? The wages of sin is death. And so what you and I owe the law is eternal death. Well, does God make an exception to that? Does, does God, well, God's just going to forgive it, and somehow abracadabra and the law doesn't have any jurisdiction over you, and uh, therefore he's just going to let you off? No. Now think with me. You'll never understand salvation until you go through this process in your mind. God doesn't negate the law he doesn't override the law he doesn't make an exception for the law and we've seen this before doesn't it? god doesn't take it away he adds something to it what did he add look at romans chapter 7 <clears throat> know ye not brethren verse 1 for i speak to them that know the law how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth okay and we've we've said this just a few weeks ago that if you go out here tonight and rob a bank and you escape with the money, and the police are coming after you, they know who you are, and you have, there's a police chase, and you get killed in a car accident, um, will you then go to court? Will they press charges? You're dead. The law only has jurisdiction over you while you're alive. The illustration that he uses here is, is that of marriage, verse 2, for the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. In other words, death satisfies the demands of the law, and death is the requirement of the law. But when death takes place, then the law is satisfying. And the law says, my work here is done. I have no more jurisdiction. There's nothing I can say. There's nothing more I have to do. But death has to happen. So verse 3, so then, while her husband liveth, if she be married unto another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Verse 4, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Why is that important? Because you are in Christ. You are part of the body of Christ. You have been associated and identified and baptized by God 
uh, in an unseen way into the body of Christ. And because you're associated with Christ and his death, his burial, and his resurrection, the Bible says that you become dead to the law. So it's not that the law dies. The law is perfect. We're the imperfect ones. And what the Bible says is God takes Tom Fittis, when I believed upon him that night, the 29th of April, 1979, and he placed me into Jesus Christ. What did that feel like? What did that look like? I have no idea. We're simply believing what God has said. In the mind of God, he has associated us with Jesus, and I was in Jesus 2,000 years ago, and when, I, when he died, I died too. When he got buried, I was with him in his burial, in the mind of God, and you were too. And the best part is, on the morning of the third day, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes, and you came up with him. That's why the Bible says, ye are risen with Christ. Now there's a future resurrection as far as our physical, practical, uh, real resurrection of our body. But in the mind of God, your person was identified with Christ in his death, burial, and his resurrection. So the Lord comes to Tom Phyllis and he says, Tom Phyllis owes me eternal death. And God looks at my record and he says, now wait a minute, uh, you're too late, Tom's already dead. He died 2,000 years ago in the person of my son and he was buried. And because, Je- because he was in Jesus instead of him in, uh, in himself, up from the grave he rose, and Jesus was victorious over death. And, and Tom Phyllis was associated with Jesus in his resurrection. And so I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I live on the other side of death. We use the illustration. I just like it because it, it visualizes it in my mind. This broad river like the Mississippi. It's filled with crocodiles and alligators and piranha fish. And you, you, name, and every, you, see, you see people just filing into the Mississippi. They're trying to get to the other side. Trying to get to the other side. It represents death. And you know how many people survive it? Nobody. They go in and they never come out. They go in and they never survive it. And if you go into death by yourself, you'll never survive it. And then rolls up this armored personnel carrier, an amphibious armored personnel carrier, the back opens and somebody says, come on in here. And you jump into the back of that thing and the door closes and the handle comes down and the engine roars and it goes into the mighty Mississippi. And you hear those alligators biting their teeth on the tires and on the metal and the prana face were going crazy. And you're thinking, boy, I'm glad I'm in here, not out there. And guess what happens? It comes up on the other side. And the door opens. And there you are on the other side. And, the, and there you are standing on the other side of death. And death has no more jurisdiction over you because it only has jurisdiction while you're alive and you die. And so that's why he says, you're become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now watch this, that you should be married unto another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law. We are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the latter. In other words, I do what I do for God, not because I have to, not because the law demands it but because I love him and you can use the illustration of a a grumpy old husband and he demands this of his wife and and, uh, he wouldn't have to be grumpy I suppose he could be uh, just matter of fact do this do this don't do that don't do that Uh, but he never helps her and she's running around and guess what she can't she can't satisfy her husband and so the husband doesn't die. The law is still effective. You know the law is still in operation today. If you're not in Jesus Christ, the law has jurisdiction over you. And death is the requirement. You say the wife dies. Now I know this doesn't happen. Some of you might, uh, well, I don't think anybody in here, but some people would wish this could happen. The wife dies. She has this grumpy husband. He's always after her case and she's never able to satisfy him. And she dies. Therefore, till death to his heart, the marriage is over he's dead but then she comes back to life again she's free from her first husband and she gets married onto her second husband and her second husband has many things that he wants as well but he is there and he helps her and he loves her and he forgives her and he's kind to her and she loves him and she wants to please him because it's a new relationship now that's just a you know it's a it's an allegory to illustrate what the law is and how we're free from the law. The law is the first husband. It tells you this, that, and the other thing, what we're supposed to do, but we fail him. We cannot satisfy him. 
He doesn't die, but we die. We died in Jesus. And when we're resurrected in Christ, we're married to another, and that other is the Lord Jesus, that we might serve in the newness of the Spirit, that our heart is involved. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all, all thy heart, soul, and mind. And Jesus has given us the motivation to do that. We love him because he first loved us. And it's, it's not that we're required uh, by the law or any set of rules, but it's a relationship with the one who has loved us and died to save us. And it's a different motivation altogether. And so with that in mind, let's go back to, in fact, look at uh, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, just to give you another scripture on that. Galatians 2 and verse number 19 and 20. He says, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Okay, everything making sense so far? Okay, I think we've got it. And that's why he goes on to say in verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified. I died with Christ. I died with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, let's go back to Colossians. And we've got to finish here real quick. Now, these are the two best verses. All that is coming up to this. He said, you died in Christ. You were buried in Christ. You were raised in Christ. And because of that, here's what happened. In verse number 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened to gather with him. Now that's interesting because the word quickener means to bring the life, to give new life, and it's, it's, uh, but the word means to gather with, and that's why he says quickened to gather with him. In other words, when Jesus was resurrected and got life, you got life. When, when the moment you believed upon Christ, all these things happened in the mind of God concerning you, and you got life in him. You're already raised in your relationship with Jesus and your relationship with the Father, even though you haven't bodily been resurrected yet, that's still going to happen. But in the mind of Christ, uh, you, in the mind of God, you have been quickened together with Jesus. And then it says, having forgiven you all trespasses. And so we were dead. We were judged in sin. But being identified with Jesus, when he came to life, we did too in him. Well, what about our sins? Notice the last part of verse 13. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Because the law has been satisfied by death, Jesus' death, and our, identified, our identification with Jesus, then God can now come and be just and the justifier, Romans chapter 3, God can be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. God can't, Listen, did you know that God just cannot forgive sin? He just cannot turn around and forgive trespasses unless death has taken place you see god is bound by his own nature and his own nature will not allow himself to just turn a blind eye to sin you know if that happened if god was the kind of god that could do that there'd be no such thing as calvary when jesus was in the garden of gethsemane praying unto the father let this cup pass for me if it be possible lord i don't want to go through this if there was any other way the father would have just said well hey that's Listen, I'll just forgive sin. I'll just, I'll just overlook it. I'll sweep it under the carpet. It's no big deal. Come on. We don't have to go through this. But there was no other way. The nature of God demanded death. And so the cross of Calvary proves two things. It proves that God is serious about sin because somebody had to die. And it proves that he loves us because he was willing to die in our place. Now, the last verse is really interesting. Because what the Colossians were facing were the Judaizers, people who were saying, well, you can be a Christian, but you've got to keep the law. Well, they don't really understand. You put yourself under law, it's bondage. Because it's not just the Ten Commandments, the 613 Commandments. There's dietary laws and ceremonial laws, and nobody's able to keep that. I mean, the sacrificial, is not, the sacrificial system is not even in operation. There is no temple in Jerusalem. There is no tabernacle in Israel. How are you going to... Go through all the feasts and all the sacrifice. It's impossible. Nobody's doing it today. Everybody's breaking the law. What hope does it give to you? You can't cherry pick the law. You can't say, well, we'll just meet on, we'll, we'll hollow the seventh day and, and pretend that, that that's somehow going to satisfy God. No, it doesn't. You put yourself under that system and it's, it's where the sky's the limit. And so what are we going to do with the law? Look at verse 14. And we're finishing with this. 
Having forgiven you all trespasses, and I like the word all, I've got a big circle around that, because it's not your trespasses from the time you got born to the time you get saved. You know when Jesus died for the, on the cross and you were on his mind, that all of your life from birth to death was future? He could see your whole life. When he died on the cross, he died for all of your sins. And when you got saved, he paid for all of them, and he forgave you all of them, as far as his judicial work. Now the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all our life. That's not God as my judge. That's God as my father. That's not, that's not um, judicial. That's relationship. That's fellowship. What we're talking about is God as our judge and the law being satisfying. So here's what he did. He forgave us all trespasses. Well, how did he do that? Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Now, the, the word ordinances goes back to basically the, the law. And so here, here was the law, these ordinances that was against us. Did you know the law is against you? Because the, the, the law says, thou shalt, and you don't. And the law says, thou shalt not, and you do. The law is against you. And it goes on to say, um, which was contrary to us. The law is going one direction, we're going another direction. We're in trouble with the law. But God did something. Because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances. He smudged it all out. All the laws that were against us, he smudged them all out. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, that were contrary to us. Well, how was he able to do that? What right did he have to do that? Because he took those ordinances, which are really indebtedness, it was a legal document where we were condemned by the law. You know, everything you've ever done wrong is, has been written down. That's why at the Great White Throne Judgment, where the unsaved will stand, the books are produced. Everybody's got a book. You've got a book. Birthday, death day, and everything in between. All the iniquities, the transgressions, the sins, the impurities, the sins of our life are written in that book. And at the end of that document, it says that I owe God. The sum that I owe God. It's a legally binding document. The sum that I owe God is eternal death. What did Jesus do with it? It says, and took it out of the way. The law, the handwriting of ordinances, and the word, the way, the word way there is in the midst. So here's the way. Here's the way to heaven. And the law was standing right in my place. And right, in, right in front of me, right in the middle. And it wouldn't let me through. The law was hindering me to get to go on. Because I had failed the law. And the law had jurisdiction over me. And it demanded death, separation from God. I couldn't get through. And Jesus came. And he took it out of the way. He took the law, the the um, handwriting of ordinances. He took the law and he took it out of the way. And here's what he did with it. Nailing it to his cross. There was something nailed to Jesus cross, remember? In fact, all crosses had something nailed to it. It's really the the condemnation of the person hanging upon the cross. So you had the, the thieves on either side of Jesus. They had, they had a board nailed to their cross and it said this man was a thief and, and uh, maybe it gives some of the details of the badness that they did. So that when people were walking by and they saw this man suffering there, they wouldn't have compassion. Oh, they wouldn't say, oh, pure, pure man. No, they would look at what he did and they would say, you deserve everything you're getting. How dare you? Yes, it's wrong in our society today. People get the death penalty and all the compassion and love and outpouring goes to the person on death row. And that, never a thought for the little girl or the little boy that was brutally raped and murdered in cold blood. Never thought for that family. No, they made sure that the condemnation was nailed to the cross. Jesus had something nailed to his cross. Boy, they tried to find something. What can we get him on? And Pilate said, in fact, it looks like when Pilate, he wrote it, Pilate wrote it himself. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And the Pharisees said, Pharisee said, no, 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 don't write that, don't write. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. He wrote it. And they kneeled it above the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But there was something unseen that happened. You see, there's a legally binding document of indebtedness. And all in that list is sin and lying and cheating, deceit and corruption and transgression and iniquity and stealing and blasphemy and covetousness. And you name it, it's on my list and it's on your list. But when Jesus died for me, he took the punishment in my place. 
and he took the document and he owned it himself. The Bible says, nailing it to his cross. And because he was paying the debt, it was nailed to his cross on my behalf. And he stamped on that record, paid in full. I don't like to see bills. Do you like to see bills? Oh, I hate to see them coming through the door. Usually we have money to pay them. But what I like to see, maybe I'm, when I'm going down to the Cal County and pay my taxes for the year for our property tax, and uh, they, 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 they give me a document that says paid in full, paid for the year, paid, paid in full. And when God looks at my legally binding document, the indebtedness of Tom Phillips, and some lists are longer than others, but the price is still the same. For you break the law at one point, you've broken all of it. It says that I owe God eternal death. But my document has been nailed to his cross and it says paid in full. And that's why he's able to forgive me of all transgressions. Now, when we get to the next verses, can anybody judge me? Can anybody say to me, Tom Phyllis, you don't deserve to go to heaven? Well, they would be right. I would agree with them. I would be the first one to say that. But can anyone say to me, Tom Phyllis, you're not going to go to heaven? Why? Because of your sin? Sin's been taken care of. You deserve to die. I'm already dead. And because I'm dead in Jesus, and because he is the Prince of Life, he was resurrected from the dead, and I get to live evermore because of him. So what we're saying is this, is that you have a complete salvation exclusively in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have him, you have everything that you need. You're complete in him. And most importantly, for heaven and for eternity, he is the Savior. He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He that believeth in me shall never hunger, shall never thirst. Um, when you have Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And you will go to the Father. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it, if it were not so, I love this. If it were not so, I would have told you. Did you know that God wants you to know? And he doesn't give all, all the detail, because I think he's saving the best, the surprises for later. <laughs> the joy is coming later. But he does want you to know that heaven's a wonderful place. He does want you to know that you're on your way there. It's absolutely ironclad. Why? Because of what he did for us on Calvary. We are complete in him. doesn't matter what the Gnostic says. doesn't matter what the Judaizer says. doesn't matter what the Church of Christ says. doesn't matter what the Roman Catholic says or anybody else. doesn't matter what the Baptists say. It's what the Bible says. And the Bible says that he has forgiven you all trespasses why would he say such a thing if it were not so why would he want to give assurance if it wasn't a real thing the fact is it is a real thing and that's why he died for you to give that for you and to you let's pray together for prayer thank god he said it is finished it's pain it's satisfied it's completed the burnt offering that jesus made upon the cross as the lamb led to the slaughter was accepted by the Father. He looked upon the travail of his soul and was satisfied. And the payment that Jesus made was enough so that he could look at you and say, you're free. He doesn't do that for everybody. It's only those who will come empty-handed, say, Lord, I can't save myself. I need a Savior. And they put their confidence in him, not in themselves, not in a shadow like the the Mass or the Lord's Supper or baptism or anything like that. No, we put our faith and trust in the substance and the true person. That's why he goes on to say these things are a shadow, but the body is of Christ. A shadow is made by the reality. The body is the one that casts the shadow. We don't want to be looking at the shadow. We want to be looking at the person because that's where salvation is. Let me ask you something tonight. Are you saved? Have you put your faith and confidence in Jesus Christ? Because when your faith and confidence is in him, that's when God makes all those unseen things. You're circumcised. You're identified with Christ, baptized into Christ. You're raised with Christ. You have new life in Christ. And you have an absolute assurance that he has forgiven you all trespasses, nailed to his cross, never to be answered by you because he answered them for you in your place. He owned it. He bore it. As we said this morning, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Father, thank you tonight.
for this wonderful, wonderful gospel. I pray that everybody in here is saved tonight. Lord, I can't see their hearts, but you can. And it would be the best thing in the world if someone who's here, who's really not saved, that right now in this service, in the stillness of this moment, as they sit where they sit tonight, and they would say, Lord Jesus, I want you to save me. I want you to take care of my sin. I want you to be my saviour. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in such a case tonight that they would say yes to you and believe upon you, come to you. And then, Lord, for those who are seeing, help us to realize that God wants us to have assurance. Why does he write all these things? Because he wants us to know these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. So, Lord, bless these thoughts, these truths to our heart tonight. And Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for willing to be our sin bearer. Thank you, for Lord, for loving us to the point where you're willing to take our shame and our, our sin and our uh, evil upon yourself and bear our judgment as our substitute that we may go free. Hallelujah. What a Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.